The same sorts of issues are important. I mean, log jams in the network, etc. Um, to some extent, I think Ryan's stuff is uh, much more realistic in some senses, but I s and and clearly of a different scale. Right. But nevertheless, the s the, to generalise what I was saying, to make it bigger, to turn the toy model into something that's r I, I hesitate using the word real in some sense because one of the problems in the world I was talking about is that um, the data, as it were, which relates to who talks to who or who might talk to who is quite different from the data that uh, in Ryan's context. Yeah. Uh, so to some extent, mine was much more a kind of conceptual model, but it still could be scaled up. Yeah. And the same issues about where the log jams are, where you can't connect, etc., and what that means are, are, are resonant in that. Right, right. Yours is based on probability, and yours is much more parametric. Uh, it, it certainly mm -hmm. can be. Mm -hmm. right. uh, it, what's worth pointing out, though, is those last simulations that I had just shown um, based on circuit theory. Circuit theory is um, a, a way that we're simply aggregating multiple agents over time, many, many iterations, right? So in each of those iterations hid behind the model, just like in a circuit, right? You release an electron, it encounters resistors and transistors. We equate those to being permeable and less permeable aspects mm -hmm. of the landscape, right? As we release millions of those random walkers, i.e. the agents, right? Mm -hmm. Through millions of iterations, we can then sum those identify how many times they encounter, and that's what you see here. So the agent-based component of those things is really behind the scenes mm -hmm. in what the model is processing to get an output that depicts flow um, at a particular time step. Right, yeah. Elliot, what do you think of all this? Um, well, I'm, I'm a bit blinded by science when we're talking about <laughs> these details. Um, yeah, the mic, yeah, Elliot's mic? Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm finding it fascinating. The, uh, the level of detail and complexity you go into, that there's, there's a common thread about workflows and conversations between disciplines. Ellie, we're going to get you a microphone just a minute. I think they're having a hard time <laughs> getting you amplified here. Either that or your mic's off. Uh, well, that's okay. Why don't you just use the microphone then? Okay. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's better. Um, it's about conversation and, and, and dialogue between various disciplines. and. It's very difficult when you're in your own sphere to know what is out there. There, there isn't sort of a framework of finding out who's doing what with that data. And there's applications that can be done with the methods you're using, by the sounds of it, in, in other aspects that we haven't thought of yet. And because I don't know what you're doing and, and a, a way of having a conversation with you about it, it's... It's difficult to include that in any kind of land use planning ideas I might have. But I think what's coming to the fore at the moment, we call it social networking, but it, really the conversations I have on the social network sites are, are academic. They're about how to do things, how to get practical workflows in place. And I think this kind of conversation and the concepts of geodesign really fit neatly with that, that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. Well, Elliot's point is, is spot on there. This example of circuit theory, for example, right? That's from computer science, right. adapted by um, really creative people and applied in connectivity conservation. It's a tool that I now use, right? So that's cross-disciplinary pollination. One of the things I think that is really critical then is the opportunities of things like this to allow us to cross-pollinate our work in this way, and that's where it becomes exciting for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about this notion of agency. Um, I mean, Michael, you you make the statement that we're not just talking about people; it could be objects, mm -hmm. buildings, uh, and of course, other species are have a kind of agency too. Uh, but, of, of course, there's certain assumptions we make, and you make, Michael, about the, the rationality yeah. of the human agent as opposed to maybe an instinctual behavioral aspect of, uh, you know, other species. Um, um, so how does one deal with agency-based models when there's different assumptions about behavior underlying them? Okay. I think um, were you to take what I was saying and try to apply it in some sense, then immediately, you know, one is posing the problem that um, we do make decisions and uh, the kind of power structure out there sort of determines what goes on in some senses, but it's not in any sense as rational as the ideal type in that sense. Right. So 
um, the, we, we need to sort of figure out um, the kind of conditions. It's a bit like saying, well, if you do want a solution which is rational, we need to somehow design the network. We need to design the process of who talks to who. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, that is something that is perhaps much more problematic than designing the system, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that's something I think we've been, that in general, we find very hard to do. But, of course, it, it does lie at the heart of uh, public participation and how we use tools, et cetera, to influence things. So I'm suggesting that, you know, simply one aspect of this is to look at how we might conceptualize participation and relationships in terms of these networks. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it means that, I think if we have a good sense of what's going on, we may be able to put in place certain kinds of relationships which do lead to, you know, you know undoing the logjam, so to speak. Right. So we do get a solution in that sense. Mm -hmm. So in a way, to think in network terms about design and uh, how we solve problems might lead us to identify certain small things that would not be possible without looking at it in these terms, which might actually lead to lead to a solution in quotes in that sense. Right, right, right. And um, what can we learn about huge human agency from what you're doing uh, in with your connectivity networks? Well, <clears throat> Michael's presentation showed me that I have a lot to learn yet. <laughs> um, so, from the from the the wildlife perspective and from a species perspective in agent-based models, those types of things, at least those that I'm familiar with, there's um, a great deal of stochasticity that can be built into those models. Mm -hmm. And they can then be parameterized based on um, uh, how uh, tightly a particular wildlife, a specific agent, um, is uh, associated with a particular habitat type. A very specialist uh, uh, type of agent would uh, have reduced stochasticity in that model. It would keep it more tightly parameterized. Whereas uh, habitat generalist then in that sense, um, stochasticity would start to balloon in that model and it would be less predictable where that agent would start to, um, uh, start to uh, actually um, be cataloged as moving. Um, so I think there's, there's ways to build that into the process. Sure. Um, but for the, the human side, that's one that I've got to chew on for a bit. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, why don't we open it up to the audience? Are there questions? Yes, Carl. Can I suggest something to, to run, on t to sit on top of his really, really good presentation? And it was the last part. The question is, which, who decides what the 10% is? Now, you decided it on the basis of a model for a particular piece of a state plan. But if you take Mike's attitude and you say, well, supposing you have competing interest groups at a state level, and you begin with those agents, and you say, well, which 10% is the hunters? Which 10% is the Tucson region? Which 10% is the fishermen? Which 10% is the developers not wanting it? The question of which is the 10% becomes a different answer. It becomes a set of answers. And then you've got exactly Mike's problem. Sure. And you could probably wait kilometers, kilometers of primary wildlife path as a function of the agents with which you have to build in your interest a coalition to get your part done at a higher level. And that's a reasonable approach to think about. You, know, you have a test case for this theory. Yes. Right. Great. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Thoughts? Um, should we go to Michael? You had your hand up. I actually had a similar response trying to cross-pollinate the talks, which is, is that um, I think the, the the social model implicit in the averaging reminded me immediately of, of Delphi and uh, mm -hmm. the work done in, in those, that universe, I guess now, of decision models. Um, I think it is really useful to think about the agent modeling applied to the, the network of social, the social planning side so that there are two people that aren't talking together. That's a gap in the, the network space and perhaps a fillable one. Um, I, I was wondering about this, this idea of combining agent-based modeling on uh, an information base, because to me, one of the, the really exciting, useful 
products of geodesign is when there is a, a model of user decision that does include both social, social interaction and some data feed in, scientific data in this case. And so I'm wondering if you could speculate a little bit about a version, for instance, of, of the London model in which there is uh, a GIS data layer feeding in of information, I don't know, rental rates mm -hmm. to make something mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. uh, that, that different agents then have potentially different responses to, but actually that, that we get to a situation with bringing in a shared information source. Because in the actual play out of these social processes in real applied projects, that in, in practical experience, we think that's one of the things, the, the advantages of geodesign pro approach, everybody, the simple way of saying it is getting people talking around a map. Well, why does that work? I'd like to see that in the agent-based modeling, both in the agent space and then on the science side of what is the information we need to provide that can get uptaked, well, bad, bad word, uh, uptaken, mm -hmm. <laughs> less good, anyway. Uh, <laughs> The, the process of us learning from science information, if it's useful in, in the real world, I'd, I'd love to, to hear your reflections of how that might be uh, simulated in the agent-based world, because when that doesn't work, that would be, be really useful to learn in the places where it's breaking. And I think it has a lot to do with the information communication role from science into planning. So. Responses? Well, uh, a couple of quick responses, I think, is that there is a, uh, there is a much harder version of the model that um, I talked about, and that is really in economics, in exchange theory, the idea that agents exchange in a market and, and uh, the balance is a price. I mean, the, the notion of, you know, the averaging, et cetera, is not a million miles away from... Uh, Edgeworth and Walrus in the 19th century basic mathematical, you know, systems where exchange takes place. Um, and a, an outcome of, uh, of that process would be prices, for example, um, which determine to some extent uh, the relative importance of things. Um, and so in some senses, if you were to go down that road, then you might be able to build in, in, in uh, to, to, to build in you may be able to tailor that model to certain aspects of the problem that I talked about. I think it's, one of the things I think that's particularly important is that um, uh, the problem, there are so many different problems that can be defined in terms of that model. Almost the way of approach is, is kind of quasi-independent of the problem. You know, the problem I looked at, you could, well, first of all, you could, disaggregate it massively. There are 80 residents or 80 flats in that area. Um, interestingly, um, in those 80 flats, probably only, you know, 30 or 40 of them are owned by companies, basically. Um, but, uh, and uh, the residents, there isn't any resident community of sorts. Uh, and if you were to construct a much bigger network of that, you would then begin to find there were lots of bits of the network which were disconnected. People would not be very interested in interacting with the corporation, you know, this sort of thing, um, or property speculators. So to some extent, it would, it, it, you, could, you could get more information of that kind. That's the first answer. The second as aspect is that I puzzled a bit about how one would truly integrate that style of thinking, because this style of thinking is very much resonant with, you know, how people over many years have thought about decision processes and this kind of thing. Um, how that can be integrated with the kind of tools that uh, uh, have been talked about extensively at this conference, in a sense. So, in other words, um, obviously the city corporation, in my example, do have a very strong planning authority in the City of London, and um, they make use of 3D models. I mean, indeed, uh, in probably they're one of the first groups 10, 15 years ago who used 3D models, in a sense. So, uh, in some senses, how does all of that feed into the kind of problem? I, I, think, I think the answers are very problematic, that it's not clear that many people have thought about that so far. Um, in other words, it's much easier to either build the little model I talked about quite separately from you know, what's going on substantively in terms of the way we're designing, um, and to actually, you know, design more substantively without thinking of the, uh, of, of, of the wider context in a formal sense. So you have these two formal, 
formal approaches that aren't really close in some sense, but need to be. I agree with you. I mean, so I think it's a big potential area for further exploration. I would, I would tend to agree with that wholeheartedly. I think the, the, the challenge um, from, from our side with these types of um, large spatial models then, as with Carl's help now, I'm thinking these agents are not only um, internal experts within Game and Fish, but they're park service and they're um, stakeholders and developers in the Department of Transportation, all providing um, uh, feedback into this process. Um, in this particular instance, there would be a, a substantial amount of lag that I, I would have to think on to figure out how we would get past, just based on the processing time required to run through uh, many of these things. Um, but I agree with that in that um, uh, I think that's a really exciting thing to start to look at as we start to um, look at varying uh, values in those sets. Uh, yes, okay. Hello, uh, Phil Murphy here. Um, one of, the, one of the things about what Michael's showing is solves one of the biggest problems um, that all of us face in public participation, which is who do you bring to the table? There may be 40 or 60 or 100 different interest groups, but the analysis that Michael showed quickly shows you um, which are very common interests. So if I get one representative from that group, I've got that particular voice in there. Um, so it helps actually, you know, in that continuum from mediation of four or five massively powerful groups to, to having 10,000 people in, how do you start deciding who should be at the table to use the really cool tools that we're all developing here? I think that's, uh, there's a nice problem-solving aspect of what uh, Michael had presented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's see, in the center up right there, yes. <coughs> Okay. Um, you were saying that you had a hard time explaining to people how they can integrate science into their design, right? Well, science is nature, and nature, math was created to understand nature. Wouldn't that all be my biomimicry? Couldn't that be the simplest and most plain way to integrate that into their design? I think you're, you're spot on in recognizing that, um, uh, that relationship. The issue with some of that is, is that lots of science isn't seen, right? So in the instance of flows and um, uh, movement and cycles, those types of things, um, those are things that we have a difficult time wrapping our head around and understanding the impacts of design and planning decisions and how they affect those types of things. So when I talk about that, um, I'm talking about those things that are unseen and processes found throughout the environment and how we take the science that, um, that articulates how those things work, um, how they interact with the natural landscape and then make sure that we can translate those into, um, into the build. So I, you're spot on in that it, it works with, um, uh, with something like that. But there's often things that are under the, uh, under the cloak of um, us being able to see that need to be integrated as well. <laughs> 